But basically, opiates uh, opiates are generated by your brain for when you're you're injured, you know, and you have real pain, right? So they can kind of maintain you in a steady state. Um, methamphetamine, uh, as I will show you, um, you know, has problems almost right away. Next slide. Here's Ibogaine, and let me see if I can get this. Let me see if I can get this. Nothing ever goes exactly as planned. So I'm going to stand next to it and point. Okay. Um, the important thing to note in this series of uh, Ibogaine uh, congeners is that this synthetic one, right, down at the bottom, which never occurs in nature, has a carboxyl attached to it. And uh, that makes it act differently. Um, but, you know, you can see it's all the same skeleton. So there's like literally dozens of variations on this molecule. Next slide. Um, the main comparison to Ibogaine is ayahuasca. And ayahuasca basically takes uh, ver veritas grass and Banisteria opsis caiapi, Banisteria caiapi, right, and puts them together in a uh, huasca tea, and you trip for about six hours, and it's like a week Ibogaine trip. Ibogaine does it all with one, mo one molecule. And um, this is apparently the stimulant part of Ibogaine. Uh, Carlos Naranjo would give Ibogaine with methamphetamine, a little bit of methamphetamine, a little bit of speed, um, which he got from his treating people with harmaline. Harmaline tends to put people to sleep, so people couldn't remember the visualization, so they couldn't learn anything. And he's a standard psycho psychologist. He wanted people to remember what they saw. So he uh, gave Ibogaine with meth, which is actually kind of, I think, counter contraindicated. But with Ibogaine, one molecule does it all. Next slide. OK, now this is the part I really needed the thing for, because you see these two guys here? This is the ventral tegmental, and this is the striatum. And the striatum goes up and governs visualization, or, or actually, it, it governs move, eye movement. And the thing is, dopamine is there to make the animal react quickly. Whatever it is, food, water, sex, it's something that you want to acquire and you don't want to waste a lot of time in evolutionary terms, uh, making up your mind, thinking about it, you just want to survive. So dopamine, this is the main line of dopamine, it goes to the forebrain through the nucleus accumbens. And um, it's interesting because some of the stuff that's happening with Ibogaine is happening right in here. And Glick is right about that. But it's not the only thing happening. That's what's important. Uh, next slide. Um, at, I was just at a conference in New York, a meth conference. And we're supposed to meet with the health department as a result of that. Uh, and they've been resistant. But they're intrigued because they're now working with something called Recharge, which is basically a methamphetamine maintenance program. 
this is the way the harm reduction movement tends to approach meth. And um, they're realizing that the, all the conventional therapies don't work. There's only a few drugs, and mostly Wellbutrin and Adderall. Adderall being a replacement for methamphetamine. But Wellbutrin, they, they, say, they say, is an SSRI. When I was in prison in Nebraska, I saw a guy crush a Wellbutrin and snort it because he was a real coke freak. So, Wellbutrin, anyway. Um, this is the experiment that proves that what they said at the, the meth forum is wrong because they got a guy named David Fawcett up there and he said, dopamine is pleasure, dopamine is reward. Dopamine is not pleasure, and, and, and I will show you this. This is a surprise reward of juice being squirted on the tongue of a rat. And they react much like a human reacts to a hit of crack. They really like that, that, that uh, uh, squirted juice. So when you first have a naive rat, um, you get a dopamine increase immediately after the squirt of juice because it's a new thing and they're programming like, hey, this is a new thing that I'm going to want, right? Next slide. But they did this interesting thing, like Pavlov's dogs. They tried having a light come on or a bell uh, two seconds before the squirt of juice. And when the animal learned to associate that with the squirt of juice, the arousal occurred two seconds earlier. Now, there's another slide that Ken shows that shows that then they paired the bell with a light, and it moved four seconds earlier, right? So it's not coming from reward. It's not... Uh, a uh, thing where, you know, you can absolutely dominate the, the organism because um, you control all pleasure, right? So you can just make the organism do what you want. It doesn't work that way. Dopamine is about arousal. Now, if you think about sex, that makes a lot of sense. Because if you try to have sex and you're not aroused, it's just not fun. Okay, so uh, think about, you know, sex. <laughs> Next line. Next slide. And this is, this is the cascade, right? Um, how dopamine comes to be in the body. It, 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 you get tyrosine is from food. Uh, then it makes it into dopa. Then it makes it into dopamine. Then it makes it into norepinephrine. The clue is that norepinephrine is for fight or flight. Dopamine is for more pleasurable stuff. But both of them are to arouse the animal to act very quickly. And you can think about a frog, right? You've seen the video of the frog. It's just sitting there, and there's a fly buzzing around. And when that fly gets into the right spot, that tongue comes out so fast you almost can't see it, and that fly is gone. Okay, that is the kind of reaction we're talking about. Next slide. Now, this was something that, you know, um, the area up here was the part of the brain that we were talking about that I pointed to before. But this is on your kidney. You usually don't think that your central nervous system is on your kidney, but it is. And did you ever hear the expression, um, you scared me so badly I almost had a heart attack? Literally, if you give somebody enough of a spike of adrenaline, you could kill them. Next slide. And here's a rat having sex. Okay, now I want to show you something here. Here, over here... He, he sticks it in, right? And it starts, and it's kind of pleasurable. And then it's arousing, right? 
because the pleasure starts a, a feedback loop and he starts arousing the animal more and he goes up to a whole new level of pleasure here and he's kind of like bumping along and then the orgasm comes, right? And he's really got a lot of dopamine because he's really aroused because the pleasure, which is mostly a matter of things like opiates and serotonin and some other like uh, neurotransmitters, is so overwhelming that his dopamine is completely engaged and then the orgasm down and go to sleep. You're familiar with that because you're a human and we're not that different from rats. Next slide. Now, what happens here, what? Huh? I didn't say that. I, 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 I said this is the time. I don't know the exact time in minutes, but I guess, you know, it must have been pretty long. I didn't look at that. Yeah, well, anyway, uh, I wish that I could have three-hour sex. Um, anyway, uh, now, the problem is with the drugs that are purely dopaminergic, like cocaine, uh, methphenylate, and methamphetamine, is that they maintain this artificially high level of dopamine in here, either from, you know, blocking the reuptake or just you know, methamphetamine releases and releases dopamine for 12 hours, which is really unnatural and kind of burns the receptor out. But what happens is, or actually it burns out the thing that squeezes it out, the terminal. Um, but you could think of this, as the effect on this in some people, as if you walked out of a dark room into bright daylight, You've done that before, right? And your eyes water, and you, 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 your eyes have to adjust, right? But then if you try to walk back into the room that was totally dark, you trip over the table or something because you've been blinded by the light. What happens is when you overstimulate some people's receptors, they're blinded by the light. They never exactly recover because these are all calcium. They're made out of calcium, like a seashell, okay? Your eye is a lot more um, flexible. This is really made to adjust the light. This is not really made to adjust. It takes a long time for like addiction to go out of the system naturally. So we decided we would find some ways to speed that up. Next slide. Okay, here is what happens though. And this is just like 100 uh, milligrams of meth one time in a mouse. And you see there were more cell bodies and just a more abundant tracery of dendrites before and now after there's less. So you're actually cutting down carrying capacity of the neurons. Next slide. So in the beginning, there was an argument about visualizations. And there were some people who were, said, well, we just really, you know, we're talking to NIDA, right? Uh, you know, I'm talking to Frank Vachi in 1991, and in the room was John Morgan. And um, NIDA is always resistant to hallucinogens. This goes back to Harry Anslinger talking about like the marijuana high driving you crazy. See that, that when, they, when they encountered LSD, they said we have jurisdiction over this because this is a high that drives you crazy, right? And they are always calling it psychotomimetic. LSD is psychotomimetic. So th th they were saying, there can't be anything good that comes from visualization. But you see, the problem is these guys came up with this hypothesis that was really, really worked out and really impressed me about how the brain works with microtubules all lighting up. And see, microtubules are really interesting. 
Microtubules are actually electrified. So just like a fluorescent light is electrified and all of a sudden, you know, the stuff inside the fluorescent light fluoresces, inside the microtubules, you have laser light. And when you have laser light, this is the interesting thing that sometime like a couple billion years ago, some primitive microorganism figured out how to do, right, to bind laser light. You have coherent light, and coherent light follows other rules. And what happens is every microtubule in your brain begins to pulse in unison and you get something called a Bose-Einstein condensate, which means that you have only really one set of thoughts in your brain, not a little separate thought for every neuron. And that means ultimately that the brain is steering all kinds of processes through a global unitary process. It also meant that if this was correct, things that would change dendrites, change microtubules, um, could be accounting for sudden but long lasting changes in the brain. Next slide. And this is a little bit uh, uh, abstruse, but these are actual what a memory is. And remember, our memories are visual. Sometimes you can be triggered by, uh, like says, smell, but then some visual memories will come up to identify what happened, like the pictures we just saw of the Netherlands. Flashback to the Netherlands, right? It's all visual, right? And it's embedded in calcium, and it's widely distributed. So you have little photos, like, like uh, you know, a little snapshot, and they're the same snapshot as in a couple places so it doesn't get lost. And I'll tell you a story. I died. I was, I, I fell over dead. I was in jail. I was being transferred to prison for the medical marijuana. And, um, uh, I was dead too long. I was dead for three and a half minutes. So they had to freeze me. I had to go into induced coma or the enzymes would have damaged my brain. So they put me in induced coma for six days and I lost a whole week. I don't know what happened during that week. And the interesting thing is that I have no memory of the morning of the heart attack because when they freeze you, you don't make these. You don't actually make visual memories, long-term visual memories embedded in calcium that uh, take short-term memory and transfer it into something that you, you can have 20 years from now. So that, at 86 degrees body temperature, that calcium does not work. That, that, that uh, chemistry does not work. Okay, so I don't know what happened. I don't remember a thing. <laughs> I can't. But these are what you're accessing with Ibogaine, with the visualizations. Next slide. And this is like a really important, important thing. And the problem is, is that when Ibogaine was abandoned in 1996 by the NIDA, uh, MASH kind of went over here, and some other people were on Ted Glick went over here, and that really influenced Howard, and Howard said in uh, Ben DeLonan's movie, Ibogaine will not be used in the future, and then a few years later he said, Ibogaine will be used in the future. You remember that? Well, all the time that he was hanging out with Glick, they didn't look at this because it had to do with the visualizations, and Glick wasn't into that. But you see this here? Neurotropins. This is what happens every day ordinarily in your brain. And this is how you correct, correct a mistaken memory. For instance, you think somebody stole your wallet, right? And you think it was Sally, right? And you go along, 
But then gradually, you build up evidence that it was really Fred. And then finally, Fred steals something else. And you say, oh, it was Fred. And you look back at everything, and you take and reevaluate all the memories, and you have a new kind of memory chain. It's from the same basic bits and pieces, but it's all rearranged, right? So now you know, um, don't let Fred into the house because he'll steal the wallet. You know, it's, it's real simple, you know. But what happens is, with these neurotropins, this is without, you know, any ibogaine being given, <laughs> you know. Ordinarily, the neurotropins cause changes in cholinergic terminals. Calcium influx always causes a different, uh, like, uh, electropotential. And this then, you know, you make uh, microtubule-associated protein and change the dendrite structure. And this is important with ibogaine. When you change the dendrite structure, you sprout new receptors. Next slide. Okay, so if you were, we had a, in 2008, there was a lecture with Howard Lotsoff and, and Alex Wodak in Barcelona. And Alex Wodak very cleverly allowed no uh, science to be introduced after roughly 2000, because he knew Howard would talk about the 1990s. And he came along with stuff right at 2000, and he said, see, this proves Ibogaine doesn't work. So this is what we knew in 2000. Number one, Jolik had discovered that it is a potent ca kappa agonist. Kappa is not like mu at all. Kappa will not cause a heroin overdose. That's mu. The whole thing about like collapsing the respiratory function, that's mu. Kappa is there to prevent that. Acutely, kappa will stop uh, uh, you from uh, kind of blacking out and going into uh, um, some kind of a heroin overdose effect. And then it turns around, and after some days, it upregulates mu. And if you've experienced kappa, it's a lot like salvia divinorum because that is a, the pure kappa agonist. And it's not very pleasant. You have weird uh, uh, visualizations. And um, it uh, down yet regulates this. What is beta arrestin? You have a number of mechanisms in your brain uh, to deal with overstimulation, because overstimulation can be excitotoxic. And um, one of them is that something can be expressed that causes your neuron to fire every second time instead of one, two, one, two. Instead, of it's, it's only two, 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 two. And this is really interesting. This is, again, uh, across all kinds of effects. Um, I remember I said it was a heart patient. I'm taking something called clopidogrel. Clopidogrel at first made me bleed. Now it hardly makes me bleed. I develop tolerance. And beta arrestin is involved in that. Kappa reverses beta arrestin. So that before, you know, you even get to the point where you have to, like, um, like withdraw, retract the receptor completely because, you know, uh, you're going to destroy it. Um, this comes in, and this is one of the first things that Ibogaine reverses. The other important thing is inhibition of cyclic AMP. Uh, that's that adenosine a uh, 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 triphase phosphate, um, uh, uh, biphosphate, the diphosphate, or whatever. Uh, that's the basic energy pump of the cell, of every cell, right? And 
ibogaine uh, affects something called a. This is a little bit on like the opiate. It affects something called adenylate cyclase. And adenylate cyclase causes all those nasty heroin withdrawal effects. But this is important. Ibogaine is not an agonist or an antagonist. Either orthogonally, ortho, ortho, orthogonally or orthogonally or um, allosterically, which means an indirect effect to have the same effect at the mu receptor at all. And MASH uh, at one point tried to say it did. And nobody, that was like a hundred times more effect than anybody else has ever been able to uh, 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 discover, and nobody could ever replicate that. So just remember, when you're talking to these people, like Dr. Ken Alper, or Dr. Jeffrey Hamlet, or Dr. Deborah Mesh, is they all disagree radically. And what this is attempting to do is put together a consensus. See, I'm a journalist. I'm just a reporter. I have no skin in the game. I don't own a patent for, like, um, nor I began, for one thing. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is like the thing that Glick is talking about. This is yet another short-acting receptor effect of ibogaine. It's, some people use it to completely explain everything because NIDA demands that you reduce it to this kind of an effect. This is why they're still studying Wellbutrin for 30 years, so they've never gotten anywhere. But the thing is that this particular alpha-3, beta-4 is in the limbic system. It's heavily concentrated right around that VTA, nucleus accumbens area. This stuff, which they're giving, actually they want to give like almost toxic doses at, at, at uh, Columbia now. I mean, the guy had a seizure. You can't give a half a gram of this stuff that you know safely, this is hits the whole body, and this is the smoking cessation effect. Next, uh, next slide. Oh yes, so this is the most interesting thing of all. You know that remember the long term term, the long acting serotonergic metabolite that Deborah Mash is talking about. That wasn't actually totally understood until recently. It's been kicking around, it's been an explanation. And she didn't like really talk about GDNF at all, I'll get to that in a minute. But you see the thing is, you see how these are a little more spread apart here, and these are a little bit more spread apart here, right? This is in the outward conformation, you're blocking the serotonin transporter. See, Serotonin is really important in cocaine and methamphetamine, okay? And if you block it in an outward conformation, with, which is what cocaine and SSRIs do, it's actually quite different from blocking with an inward conformation because somehow the ibogaine is getting in there and tricking the... Um, transporter into thinking it's already got a serotonin in there, which is a completely different, it's, it's got repletion. It's not like craving. You understand what I'm saying? It's a subtle difference, but uh, it's a pretty important difference. Um, so this was actually just discovered, so we're still finding out things about like basic stuff we thought we knew. Next slide. Here's, <laughs> and this is actually given in um, Wikipedia as the explanation of how ibogaine works. And what it is, they're saying there's th three short-acting neurotransmitters that combine to have a long-acting effect. 
And what they're saying is that even though it's a nicotinic blocker, it has other effects where acetylcholine is being released further down the line, and they can't really account for this, and having an anti-addictive effect. Okay, now I gotta like pause for a minute and tell you something about acetylcholine, because you're kind of familiar with serotonin, and you're kind of familiar with dopamine, right? Most people in the room, because you know serotonin is like LSD, and dopamine is like speed, right? Um, acetylcholine is really apparently involved in visualization and memory. Acetylcholine is a really interesting neurotransmitter. It's synthesized at the mitochondria. Mitochondria generates energy for the cell. It goes out into the intercellular cleft, and then um, there's a cholinesterase that strips off uh, the acetyl, and you have this choline, which is sucked back in, it goes back to be remanufactured over and over again as acetylcholine. So there's an energy transfer taking place. So what this same woman, uh, uh, Nancy Wolf, said is that the place in the base of the brain where the visualization occurs has a really heavy, uh, well, actually the memory, the kind of the connection of visualization to memory occurs has really heavy distribution of, of acetylcholine, so we know that, that that's involved in that. But Ken Alper cannot explain this slide to me. This is from the Scientific American trash job when I began. There was a Scientific Amer American, that kind of something like detox or die, you know, and um, it's just a whole, it's just full of misinformation. Next slide. This is the one that makes you sick, you know, all that car sickness and stuff with Ibogaine. That's because you get acutely conscious of your inner ear. And when you're acutely conscious of your inner ear, it's very easy to get car sick. And Glick said, we've eliminated this. He also said, we've eliminated like NMDA, we've eliminated serotonin. There's no long acting serotonin a metabolite with uh, 18MC. So um, it was previously thought to be an opioid receptor. It interferes with balance, as I said. It's implicated in the development of tardive dyskinesia, which is this rocking thing that people have uh, with um, uh, after doing um, Thorazine or Haldol. Um, and it one thing it's good for is it blocks NMDA toxicity. Next slide. NMDA. Um, when this was first discovered, uh, we thought this explains everything because there's other NMDA uh, drugs uh, one called disulfine is used as an anti-stroke drug. And when they went back and gave disulfine to the rats, lo and behold, it had the same effect of cutting opiate withdrawal and cutting supersensitization to sen stimulants. Supersensitization is when you can't stop eating the potato chips. You can't stop doing the coke. Uh, it might also decondition this pathway, and the interesting thing about this pathway is this pathway is also connected to the cannabis. Uh, cannabis works as a back signaler because glutamate heats things up in the whole system. That's where inflammation comes from. So you have to have an anti-inflammatory, so there's a way of squirting endogenous cannabinoid back at the glutamate firing cell saying, turn down the heat in the room. Um, so they wanted to get rid of this because it reminded them of angel dust and angel dust is, you know, you know what people think of angel dust is horrible stuff. Um, 
but when I was at uh, London, I said, I think that, you know, this is, this controls stroke, right? If you have a stroke, what happens is you have a cascade, and the cell that's in, like, distress because it can't get oxygen and it can't get nutrients any longer because of uh, a cell, you know, the blood is blocked, um, starts firing off a lot of glutamates. And the glutamates go to the next layer of cells, and what they do is they open up this channel, and calcium rushes in, and you have a stroke, you have cell damage, and then it, it like basically spreads in concentric circles. So they came along with this disulfopine stuff, and they said, we can stop that, and if you inject disulfopine in time, you'll present, you will stop most of the stroke damage, provided they know what's going on and they know to do that. But um, I said, it's also important to control this receptor to let a little bit of calcium in, because it can control it through this uh, uh, magnesium ion here. It can control it and, next slide, rebuild all this architecture that's been, you know, say, fucked with by doing way too much methamphetamine. Next slide. So here is the effect. And what, what had happened was I was predicting, I was saying, you know, based on what the French said, with the effects of REM, uh, we may expect that some regrowth is going on with Ibogaine or with plain old REM sleep, right? And one or more growth factors could be expected. It's just we didn't know about growth factors until it was discovered, and then we said, oh, we better study up on growth factors. So we found out a lot about a lot of this stuff long after it was, it was really, could have been figured out. But you see here, these little guys here are now talking to each other. Before, they were like isolated men in a prison yard, not talking to each other, right? Now, the inmates of the prison, this is a bunch of like cancer cells in a petri dish, have like actually stuck out um, dendrites to talk to the other cells. And you can see this is 48 hours. And Ibogaine increases GDNF reception. Next slide. Um, next slide. Yeah, see, 12 fold. That's a big, big jump. Go back one slide. Now, ordinarily, GDNF comes along, and it's very complex. It has to recruit something called an RET. And then it sends a, a long cascade, which is not really represented here properly, down to um, the nucleus, and the skyhook comes in and pulls some DNA out that can make... Um, messenger RNA that can then go <laughs> into, you know, the pre-propeptide, because this is a peptide, and peptides, see, over here, these are ordinary uh, things like dopamine and serotonin are manufactured right at the terminal. Peptides, and there's a lot of these things, have to be manufactured at the cell nucleus, and they have to go through, they have to sit around and, and, and be synthesized, and then they come out through large core vesicles, and they're squirted. They can be, you can squirt like uh, opiate, like endorphin, into the blood, and it can like uh, affect pain far away from where the opioid is manufactured. Um, there's another interesting, uh, I'll just say there's another interesting uh, peptide, which is all the cortisols. And uh, the cortisols uh, uh, are steroids. And the interesting thing about them is they have a subsurface receptor. So when Alex Wodak got up and confidently said, the only thing that works is agonist drugs, that what he was saying was, you have to go through the opiate receptor, 
or you have to go through the dopamine receptor. But there's ways of going under the surface of the cell. And what we're seeing with Ibogaine is that it's doing that. But go, go on to the next slide. Yeah, that we slide we did already. Well, somehow Ibogaine is getting into the cell, going directly to the GDNF. You get this huge surge of this growth factor. It goes out and goes to many other cells and does the regular thing of glomming onto the cell surface and making more GDNF. So you set up a long-acting beneficial loop. When we were giving Ibogaine in the beginning, we thought, let's do a big flood dose like they do for um, the people who are initiates in Africa, because that's the way to do it, that we learn from the Africans, right? Actually, there was something to that. And now we're looking at microdosing a lot. But once you set this thing in motion, it's like turning on a, a motor. It doesn't turn off. After the metabolite is gone, and you no longer have a serotonergic metabolite, so you're no longer like tripping on like a Prozac-like effect or something, this growth factor is still churning out growth factor. And that could go on for months. So that's the reason we give a big dose, it turns out. Next slide. And then they did this study in 2010, in October, that showed that Ibogaine, that Noribogaine, but not 18MC, exhibit, exhibits similar actions as Ibogaine on GDNF expression. So the, now Ken says it's still making GDNF. We just can't prove it, right? And uh, Jeff says, well, uh, 18MC is really no safer than Ibogaine. It's all also going to have a herd channel blockade. But the interesting thing is that the people who own uh, Phytostan have patented the um, anti-Parkinson's effect because this is a new Ibogaine patent that will last for 23 years, right? And as well they should have because Bob Sisko made the actual, I told him to do it. I said, based on what Ken had said, I said, you've got to try this out, right? But he actually made the Ibo Plus and actually gave it to somebody in Mexico, and lo and behold, it worked. The other thing is the Demerex people have patented Noribogaine for Parkinson's. But the 18MC people, based on this, have not. Next. So what is it doing? It's just sitting here. This is an ibogaine molecule. This is not supposed to be here. This is way inside the cell on a herd channel. Now, you have a lot of herd channels. So unless you get like above a certain amount of ibogaine, you don't have a problem. Because it takes an actual ibogaine molecule to go in and block every single herd channel for you to have one of those arrests, right? And if you microdose with Ibogaine, that's never going to happen. And now we've been shown you get robust microdose effects for GDNF for as little as four milligrams twice a day for a month. And, you know, this guy started to, like, recover. He could button his shirt again. He could, like, uh, use a, uh, a knife and a fork. He could write his name again. And when I went and saw him, he could drive a car because he drove me to the restaurant. And he bought me lunch. His name is Dean Kornstrom. And his brother, Lee Kornstrom, rode on the bus with Ken Kesey. So the family is known to um, uh, Paul Krasner. And Paul Krasner lined us up um, because, you know, 
I guess Cisco asked Bob Fass, and he asked Paul Krasner, and we came up with somebody who was a Parkinson's patient. It was an atypical patient, so he didn't have tremor. And so it was a very pure effect. But um, you see, this is once again, Ibogaine is getting into the cell. So it's acting like a little bit like a, a steroid. Um, and um, I'll, 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 that's the main point of this. Next slide. This is nor Ibogaine, OK? Uh, I just wanted you to see it again. And this is where this, this thing apparently is snagging on the cell surface. If the cell surface is permeable to Ibogaine, the carboxyl is a snag. So you have no long-acting serotonergic metabolite, but presumably you're not supposed to have any Herg blockade in either. Next slide. And it, it's got some pretty, you know, this HNMC is, is no slouch when it comes to having effects. Uh, they're talking about maybe if you give a really huge dose of uh, Wellbutrin that you can reduce, and naltrexone on top of it, you can reduce uh, methamphetamine use 30%. This is 60% right off the bat. And look at what it does to nicotine. Next slide. But the explanation is, you know, in this whole complex brain that this one spot with this one kind of receptor, uh, the alpha-3, beta-4, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, you can reverse addiction. That just seems a little bit like a stretch to me. Next slide. And this shows, actually, shows the effect of uh, placebo and bupropion. And you can see it's less than placebo. So this is not a very effective drug, <laughs> you know. Next slide. But here, um, you see the, the drop off in methamphetamine? Next slide. Look at the drop off on nicotine. Ken Alper had a meeting with uh, Steve Hurst and um, uh, Stanley Glick, and he said, we should go for methamphetamine. And they said, no, smoking cessation. Less controversial. Uh, Sativex, or not Sativex, the Savant, as nearly as I can tell, is dead in the water right now. They're not getting the money they need to do a big clinical trial either. Next slide. Okay, now this is very important. I will read it. The hallucinations are just an unfortunate side effect, Glick asserts, explaining that Ibogaine works in the brain like a hybrid of PCP and LSD. Part of the problem is that when you go through this thing, it's so profound, you've got to believe it's doing something. In part, it's an attempt by the person who's undergoing it to make sense of the whole thing. Generally speaking, Glick's research on rats has shown that Ibogaine dampens the brain's so-called reward pathway, reducing the release of neurotransmitters like dopamine, which cause the highs associated with everything from heroin to sugary foods. The compound has also been proven to increase production of GDNF, a type of program protein that quells cravings and to block the brain's nicotinic receptors the same spots that are stimulated by tobacco and other addictive substances. Now, what's wrong with this statement is that people do learn things on Ibogaine that stay with them for the rest of their life. And when it works, it changes their behavior. So you have an effect where something is happening on the level of consciousness that's having long-term effects in the material world. And uh, he's kind of saying that um, it's all hallucination. But is it REM? I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and the other thing is you cannot really characterize this as dampening. Imagine you have an orchestra and you have a certain number of microphones 
in the orchestra to record a record. And you decide the sound isn't quite good. So you go in and double the number of microphones. And all of a sudden, the sound is much clearer. There's much more detail. I don't think that's dampening. And what is clearly happening is you're sprouting new receptors. And that's what's saving you. OK, next slide. This is what's upsetting them. This is what's upsetting them here, OK? This is a guy on Ibogaine. He isn't doing anything. He's no threat to anybody. He's just on a couch, dreaming. Next slide. Um, the important takeaway from this slide is that, you see, this is being awake, and this is REM sleep. And these are the closest of any of these brainwave things. So what happens is, when you dream, you actually can remember in the morning when you wake up. Because they're close enough to each other that you can remember your dreams. And uh, the French said that Ibogaine is mimicking REM. And actually, in Uruguay, somebody did a mouse study where they wired a mouse up, and lo and behold, the mouse um, was kind of going in between NREM stage one and NREM stage two, Qu never quite entering REM, but it was close to REM. So it is kind of a remogen. Next slide. Now, this, you got acetylcholine again, and acetylcholine is right next to the dendrite. There's no separation. Acetylcholine is powering the visualization in the dendrite. Here's glutamate. Glutamate heats things up, remember? So there's a spine to protect the dendrite from the heat. But what that's doing is like infrared. It's flashing. Every time it flashes, it disrupts the wave in here a little bit. So the wave is being changed from a wave to a series of photographs, like a movie. And that, in turn, every time that pulse happens, all these other neurotransmitters are generated in the brain. Next slide. This shows a little paramecium trying to get around a barrier. And you know, it doesn't have a central nervous system, but it can basically take in light, take in uh, stimulus, and process it, and figure out how to get around the rock. Next slide. So here is um, the different ways neurotropic factors can work. But the important thing is the direction of the growth of neurons Neurons can also model their surroundings, can figure out how to tell other neurons to grow toward them so that they can establish communication. Next slide. Now, in the history of Ibogaine, there's a guy named Molliver who discovered a form of neurotoxicity in the cerebellum if you give like 10 times as much Ibogaine to the rat as we give to humans. So it doesn't ever really occur. But that was used to block it, and it's still cited. Like in that trash job article in Scientific American, they made a big deal out of neurotoxicity. So what is happening is that it shows something about the mechanism. You're firing bursts of, of energy, bursts of waves, up into the cerebellum. OK. Now, the importance of this is you go to the next slide. Next slide is that you want to move control because the cues, okay, the part of the cerebellum is to part of the brain that enables you to ride a bicycle and conduct a conversation at the same time. In other words, your body rides the bicycle. 
The problem is that when you're addicted, your body walks you down to the corner to buy cigarettes so you don't even think about it until you're paying for the cigarettes. And then, oh, yeah, I, I said I was going to quit these, <laughs> you know. Um, so as, if the cerebellum controls addiction, you're screwed. And you've got to remove control back to the prefrontal cortex where, where we make decisions. How do we do that? Next slide. Ah, this is what the French discovered. There are these other bursts, just like some bursts are coming up into this guy. Some bursts are coming up to something called the uh, geniculate, nu uh, uh, geniculate nucleus. The geniculate nucleus is where REM occurs. So that they showed that it's like your eyes are flickering, right? They can show the same wave in the geniculate nucleus. And then uh, it goes back into the occiput, where the actual visualization occurs. And, and that, in turn, you know, uh, keys into memory, which is happening down here. So you have one of the things we discovered from reviewing this information is you have bursts of waves going up into the cerebellum. At the same time, they're going to the geniculate nucleus and kind of spotlighting People say, I remembered why I was addicted. I saw, you know, my cues. Once you can see your cues, you control them in the prefrontal cortex. Next slide. So uh, we're now coming to the end of the uh, thing, which didn't, wasn't really that much longer than he thought. But here are some people who wouldn't talk to me from Columbia University. I tried to talk to them. And what they did was they found that if you take and get rid of this one little link right here, you have something that's much stronger. It not only expresses two and a half times as much GDNF, it expresses something else called fibro fibroblast growth factor, right? Which is another growth factor. And we, we, I began maybe doing other growth factors. It just hasn't been checked out yet. Remember that. So these guys found out they had this stuff that was really robust. The problem was it was probably too toxic to go into humans. Next slide. This is how they did it. That shows how they went and deconstructed an ibogaine molecule and ended up without that, that little link there. So anybody can do this. Next slide. They're doing it in Montevideo. And lo and behold, there are certain guys here, right, that do GDNF that are not cytotoxic. Now they have to check out cardiotoxicity. They have to specifically check out herd blockade. But they're on the path to safer ibogaine. And there's going to be a guy here later who's going to be talking about how we can totally synthesize any of these drugs from scratch. Okay, We don't even need a plant. Okay, so. The people who say you're going to destroy the rainforest, okay, if you really want us to, we will go and make ibogaine by the ton synthetically and just give it out in Afghanistan to the junkies, right? But if you want to work with us, we can, like, make the people in Gabon have a sustainable agriculture. Just don't char try to charge me $3,000 a kilo for root bark yam. It's never going to work. You're just going to make it beyond, like, you know, you're going to make ibogaine be $500 a gram. Anybody here for $500 a gram? Or would you rather get it for $100 a gram? So anyway, I'm going to wrap up with one point. This is what I always try to get to in this thing, and I never get to, I never get to the point. I got into a lot of trouble, and kind of got, they kind of went off and started um, Gita without me. And I put on a really great conference in Boston with um, MAPS. And Rick Doblin, we had 60 people, right? And we were streamed on the internet. But Howard and Ken and Dimitri and everybody went to Sayulita and started Gita, which is kind of a statement. This is the end of Howard's life. Well, that was because of an argument over a patent that Howard took out for hepatitis C. Now, I will tell you, Ibogaine is effective for hepatitis C, but it's not as effective as Harvoni. And when 
Bob Sisko had to take something for his hepatitis C. He didn't take Ibogaine, even though he owns the Ibogaine company. He took Harboni. Okay, so Ibogaine does many, many things, but it may not do them quite as well as another medication for that particular indication. And I'm just going to go through the list of things that it can do. Uh, it is an antiviral. It is an antibiotic. It is an antifungal, which I took because I had a little mold in my lungs. That's the only time I took Ibogaine. And I only took about a fifth of a dose, and it, I don't want to do it again because I don't like puking. Ibogaine is like a dab overdose, which is you have to lay really still, and if you try to move, you will puke. That's what I experienced. I'd done a dab overdose, and I'd done a fifth of a dose of Ibogaine, and it's the same thing, okay? Ibogaine is anti-tumor, like something like half of all tumors shrink when you give Ibogaine. That's no, no surprise because it's embedded in vincristine and vinblastine is a dimeric Ibogaine molecule. Ibogaine is anti-parasite. They found out it works for leishmaniasis. It kills the little bug that's in the river fly that blinds people in Africa. And actually, that is what 18MC has been tested for. Because these things will stick across a broad number of molecules. They'll be the same. I am going to propose a sixth effect with those five today. And I'd really like a little, little five-minute discussion of this, because people have seen this effect with um, Daniel, we've multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis. Ibogaine treats autoimmune disease. And the, me the actual like, uh, mechanism is REM sleep, just like a lot of REM sleep will help get you over various autoimmune problems. They'll, they'll be better. So how many people here have seen the Ibogaine effect on um, multiple sclerosis? Anybody? Because there were people who told me about this. I guess there's nobody in the room. Well, does anybody have any questions? I'm going to get take, take two, one or two questions. Sorry, no, we, we don't have time for questions. Come on, Daniel. man. We're completely, oh, come on. like, over. Yeah, but you can't keep on, you can't keep on saying that because there's yeah, people yeah, waiting right. on Zoom. I know, I know. All right, does anybody, does anybody 